All right. Well, I guess it's uh, 9.15. So uh, I am uh, Georgiana Sancho. I'm the curator uh, at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum and uh, just launching the first panel of Future of Tradition. Uh, we don't need much of an introduction about the event. It, it used to be a on-site event and we uh, welcome uh, students, mostly high school students on uh, on site, uh, but uh, with uh, with the pandemic, we ha we had to adapt. So we found this solution, and uh, the uh, we took advantage of the fact that we can communicate with uh, colleagues who are uh, farther away, and we are very happy to launch uh, the restoration. Um, the restoration uh, uh, panel uh, with uh, uh, Sheena Jones, who's a uh, curator collections registrar, I believe, at the Petiwawa Military Museums. Uh, Jeremy Neil Blowers, who's a curator executive director at the uh, Ontario Regiment Museum. And Corporal Mathieu Bergeron, who is joining us from Latvia. Uh, Corporal Bergeron is uh, currently deployed uh, with DND, um, uh, with uh, his, with to RCR more precisely, but he participated in a very interesting restoration project. And uh, uh, the panel begins with uh, uh, a video that I have to uh, launch. Hello, and welcome to Careers and Heritage Restoration presented by Shayana Jones with the Garrison Petawawa Military Museum in conjunction with the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum located in London, Ontario. The Garrison Petawawa Military Museum is located in Petawawa, Ontario. We are part of the 4th Canadian Division Support Base Petawawa, also known as 4CDSB. The base commander is Colonel J.D. Bass and the Formation Sergeant Major is Chief Warrant Officer A.J. Dunford. The museum's collection represents the history of Garrison Petawawa and the larger units on base. We've been asked by the RCR Museum to speak about restoration as a career in the heritage sector. I'm presenting a very cool project that we began in the fall of 2018 and was completed in the summer of 2019, the restoration of heritage firearms. But first, let's take a look at where I work. I am the collections manager at the Garrison Museum, and this is my office. This is my current project. It is a recent donation of one Canadian Parachute Regiment uniform, photographs, and letters. We're very excited about this donation. As you can see, we have a wide variety of historic items. We currently have over 700 uniforms, maps, photographs. We have mortar rounds, medals from the First and Second World Wars, and from conflicts around the world where Canadians have been participants. We have trophies and sculptures, flags, and a very large archive. This is just to show you a few of some of our objects. The museum also has approximately 250 firearms from pre-First World War to the 1980s. And this is where our project begins. A large number of firearms were deactivated when they were donated to the museum. Basically, they were no longer functionable. As our weapons are often used by regiments on the base for teaching tools, it was suggested that we restore our weapons so that they could be fired. I sought out the help from a team of weapons technicians from two service battalions. A full inventory of the serviceable weapons, weapons that could be restored and fired safely, was performed and the weapons were sent off to the weapons shop on base. The firearms were welded in various parts to render them inoperable, and these modifications were intended to be permanent. The team removed the welds and in a few cases manufactured replacement parts. The project took into consideration the history of the firearm and care and diligence was evident throughout the project. When the restoration was complete, it was time to test the weapons. Another team, consisting of ammunition experts, was tasked with determining if the weapons could be safely used with modern ammunition. Together, the museum's collections manager, me, the team of weapons technicians, and the ammunition technicians worked together to ensure the integrity and safety of the project. And it was a complete success. After a year of hard work, we sought the help from CSOR for the use of their range to test fire the weapons. Here is a sample of what an AK from the conflict in Cyprus sounds like. Right. 
also a thread gun from the Second World War. We are looking forward to working with other museums so that this project can be reproduced around the country, working to restore heritage firearms so we can learn and understand how they worked and sounded to better understand their impact on Canadian soldiers in conflict. Hi, I'm Jeremy Blowers, the Executive Director of the Ontario Regiment RCAC Museum in Oshawa, Ontario. And I'm here today to talk to you about restoration. Uh, here at the museum, we have a collection of military vehicles. That's uh, over 140 vehicles. Most of them are operational. So restoration here is always ongoing. We have uh, vehicles that we are bringing back from wrecks or abandoned vehicles, and also just the constant uh, maintenance and restoration requirements of the fleet. So I'm just going to show you a few clips of some of our uh, videos that we released this year so you can see some of the projects that we've been working on and meet some of my team. Okay, 
thank you for uh, creating the video, first of all. So uh, you have a little bit of a, uh, uh, an overview of uh, how uh, restoration projects uh, come about in museums such as ours. And uh, it is a really interesting um, uh, sample, I would say, because on one hand you have the vehicles, on the other hand, uh, uh, the weapons. And um, uh, we have a few questions that uh, have come through the uh, uh, registration. But before we get to the questions, I am going to ask uh, everyone to uh, say a few words about their career, uh, introduce themselves. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Corporal Bergeron. Hi, so uh, my name is Corporal Matt Bergeron. I'm a uh, weapons technician posted a two service battalion in CFP Fatawala, uh, currently deployed with the QRCR battle group in Latvia. Um, I've been in the military for just under six years now. Uh, firearms have always been a passion of mine, being able to work on them the way they work themselves. Uh, and being able to engage in this project with the Garrison Museum was uh, quite interesting. Thank you. Uh, next one on my screen is uh, Jeremy. Yeah, so I'm uh, Jeremy Blowers, the Executive Director of the Ontario Regiment RCAC Museum in Oshawa. Um, I've been in this position for just five years. Um, I have a uh, background in history um, and uh, I was uh, originally a volunteer at the museum uh, in another career. Um, I didn't uh, pursue the museum's career in my younger days as I had hoped. Uh, I went off and did some business, uh, but then uh, came back into the military museum's uh, industry um, about eight years ago. So I've been doing this ever since. Okay, so uh, the next one is uh, Shay. Hello, my name is Shayana Shay. You can call me Shay Jones. Um, and I actually have a little slide because I find it much easier to actually um, see. So uh, I have a varied background um, in museums and let's see if I can share my screen. Here we go. And if you present. So um, I went to university, got a BA in history. Then I went to Fleming College, uh, which is in uh, Peterborough, a great program if you're thinking of going that route. Um, I started work at the Peace River Alberta Museum way back in the early 90s, um, and that's in Alberta. I was a first person historical interpreter at uh, Fort William Historical Park. So basically I interpreted an actual person. Um, her name was Josette Haldane. Anyhow, uh, then I went on to the Hockey Hall of Fame. I did some work in Ottawa. Um, and then I finally got this job here as collections manager um, about uh, two years ago. And I've been working here ever since and I absolutely love my job here. So I'm going to hopefully escape this. Let's do shop sharing and we're done. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Uh, now we are going to move on to the questions. And I believe the idea is that, uh, first of all, I pass the questions uh, that came uh, with, the, uh, with the earlier registrations. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, every one of you, the panelists, to uh, try answer uh, in the same sequence as we were uh, speaking now. So uh, the first question is, what was the most difficult artifact to restore? Why and how did you, how did you do it? So uh, Corporal Bergeron. Uh, so for our collection, the most difficult artifact we had to restore was probably um, the, the FNC-1A1 we had in the it's an old service rifle that the Canadian Armed Forces used. However, when we received it, it was uh, heavily, heavily deactivated. Um, our goal wasn't to uh, fire it. It was to return it to uh, what we call a cock and click deactivation. So um, the item now is in a state where it's never going to fire. However, uh, the action can still be manipulated. It probably took us about uh, three weeks in order to carefully remove a lot of the welding uh, in order to create a lot of the parts. Uh, that being said, one item we did fire 
parts was the front pin was broken and trying to find uh, a fully fire pin for a fully automatic AK-40 in Canada because of prohibited weapons very few people own them. Uh, so as well as businesses don't agree for, for firearms, but they're not going to be able to uh, was quite difficult. And we actually ended up getting it from uh, a gentleman in who had it from probably, I think it was the early 60s, just sitting in a toolbox. That was probably the most rewarding uh, item we worked on, or at least I worked on personally, because I got to see um, that item go from where it's never going to shoot to actually being able to repair it and fix it with the original parts and get it going. That is uh, very interesting. So, uh, uh, Jeremy. Uh, the, the most uh, difficult artifact to restore was actually the uh, Canadian Mark V uh, Centurion tank at the end of that video. Uh, that had been a 15 year restoration project. Uh, it was a gate guardian. Um, and uh, so reversing the, um, you know, uh, reversing the, the welds and uh, the mothballing of the vehicle. It actually started before I was here. This is how long this restoration was going and it was a stop start. Um, then once I became executive director, I was absolutely determined that a Canadian tank museum would have a Centurion tank. Uh, there was some funding difficulties and then really just gathering, um, you know, just kind of like uh, 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 Matt was saying, gathering the required materials. Uh, mm -hmm something you know of that vintage and uh, some of the you know we tried to save the original engine um, and it was just too far gone from sitting outside uh, for 30 odd years uh, we then had to source an engine we ended up finding one in the United States um, a company in the United States had bought all of the Centurion engines once the, uh, the Canadians had mothballed the program and uh, also working with other military museums and, and uh, people working on Canadian, Canadian Armed Forces bases across the country, uh, finding all the little pieces uh, that we needed to make it operational. So the most difficult, uh, the most expensive, but um, you know, I would agree with my colleagues here, the most rewarding of, of the ones that we've done. Yes, and uh, as we can see, a restoration project is a very complex endeavor, whether it is a, a huge vehicle or a firearm, or uh, as I'm sure uh, Shay will, uh, will tell us uh, next, uh, a small little uh, item, uh, I don't know, a paper um, uh, drawing or something like that. Uh, it is more complex than one would think, and it requires a lot of uh, expertise, which is uh, supported by background education of all sorts. So next one is Shay to answer the question. Yeah, so basically my role in this project was getting the team together. So that was my hardest part is finding people who were able to have the same respect that I did for the artifact and be able to restore it to uh, firing. I know Matt hates this word, but live firing condition. Um, and so that was the most difficult part because there was a lot of different people that were involved in getting the teams together, getting everyone to speak together. If you know the military, not all the regiments get along. They have like little... <laughs> things here and there. So finding the team to get together so that I could trust them with my artifact, that was probably the biggest thing that I that I found. Yeah, so uh, we discovered that uh, a restoration project uh, requires not only specific expertise, but also uh, management skills. Uh, it's a big, it's a big uh, teamwork sometimes. And um, yes, that's, uh, that's how it goes. Um, so the next question is, how do you approach a restoration project? Do you start with the outside inside of the object, certain things you always do when you first approach a project? So again, uh, we go with Mathieu uh, or Matt. Uh, so the way I generally approached uh, the various artifacts is 
first thing I do is I do a lot of research on it. A lot of the, the, the firearms that the museum had, I have never seen before. Um, so it required a lot of reading and looking up in order to figure out first how to take it apart, as well as to figure out how it's supposed to function. Um, so I'd usually start with research. And then as soon as I feel like I have done enough research, I'll start doing a complete detailed disassembly so I can have a good inventory of the parts and what's an actually, what is in a uh, functional condition versus what needs to be replaced or if a part needs to be manufactured or acquired. And then from there, it just goes up to completing an inspection, reassembling, doing a function test, um, and so on and so forth. Jeremy? Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm, I'm getting an education here as well at the strange parallels between uh, your work, uh, Mathieu, and, and also ours. <laughs> um, yeah, very much, uh, you know, first is, uh, researching the art of, is it, why are we going to restore this? Um, what's the important, what's the educational value or um, historical importance of this vehicle artifact? Um, then it, what mark is it? What actually, you know, just as, as uh, the last speaker was saying, uh, do we have the documentation on it? Do we have the manuals? Do we, uh, doing all that research about, you know, will we have the tools we need, the, the knowledge base and or the references uh, to complete the job? Then also it's uh, assessing the, the current situation of the vehicle. We'll always approach a restoration in, uh, instead of making a vehicle look pretty or correct, we will first make sure uh, that it is mechanically sound, um, that, it, the, you know, that the engine works, that the systems on the vehicle work um, before we get to, to the more cosmetic restoration on, on the exterior. So a lot of research um, that goes you know, before we even start and uh, sort of building your team and building your knowledge base uh, and building your documentation. Yes, so uh, in other words, uh, for some, uh, the question would be what is uh, restoration, right? And up to what point uh, you, you go in your um, uh, restoration and uh, what are the items you select for, uh, for that process? And uh, Shay, sorry. So pretty much the same thing that both Matt and Jeremy have said, um, research, 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 can't emphasize that enough. And nobody has all the answers. Um, that's another big thing to know when you're doing restoration. Even when you're getting up to the, the really highest levels in different museums like the Smithsonian, um, the British Museum, everybody uses documents to help with their research. So everything's basically already been said. I just need to emphasize the research. Yes, and uh, I, I would like to add from my personal experience, uh, not only for um, vehicles or weaponry, so not only in military museums, but in other type of museums, a restoration project uh, is, uh, uh, to use a popular term, a big deal. It takes uh, uh, research, it takes funding, first of all, uh, then uh, thorough research, and then uh, committees and commissions of experts to decide on exactly how the restoration will be uh, undertaken, uh, what exactly are we going to restore, and uh, you know, uh, the, the idea being to stay as close as possible to the original, to remain uh, in, in that uh, uh, realm. Okay, so now I guess we can uh, move on to question number three. Anyways, uh, the third question is, uh, have you ever had to give up on an item? And uh, why did you, what happened? So uh, have you ever had to give up a restoration project technically? And why? So, uh, up, uh, the um, and our end state originally was to restore to a point in which we could fire it. Um, however, throughout the project, we realized that um, the barrel may have been welded. That metallurgical 
uh, changes of the barrel itself, making it not safe to fire or uh, leaves to be mangled. So, uh, necessarily, though, we had to give up, but we went from we want to fire this weapon to uh, now it's just going to be able to be manipulated and be used as a training aid. Uh, the, the connection is really uh, interesting and challenging with uh, Matthew, but uh, next one is Jeremy. Uh, yeah, we we had planned to, um, we did receive uh, RG-31 Nyala um, that was actually a veteran of the Afghanistan conflict, and uh, we had hoped to restore it uh, to full running condition. Um, you know, as a perfect example of, of some of the equipment that our, our personnel used in that conflict. Um, however, once again, that project sort of died on the vine in that initial research um, phase where we found that the decommissioning of the, the object had been to the point that uh, it was financially not feasible. And then also reaching out and finding that the parts, uh, the engine, all the things that have uh, were missing from the vehicle were no longer obtainable in Canada. So it remains a gate guard, and that's just one that uh, we had to give up off on and didn't get off the ground. Yes, very interesting uh, experiences. So, Shay, it's your turn. Okay. Um, so to follow up, I'm not sure if everybody caught what Matt said, but there was a, we have a large collection uh, of uh, Thompson machine guns, which mm -hmm. were used heavily in World War II and none of them could be fired. And that was a heartbreaker for us. So we had to give up on that. The good thing though, is that we made a connection with another museum, you might've heard of it, the National War Museum in Ottawa. Um, and had it not been for COVID, we would have had another shoot this summer and they would have brought their Thompson. So even though we have to give up sometimes on the, uh, the weapons in our collection, um, you can always reach out to your partners um, and see if they can help out. Matt, do you have something to say? Yeah, so uh, the reason we couldn't fire the Thompson wasn't because it was unsafe or we couldn't restore it. It was the range templates on base didn't allow for the caliber used within the Thompson submachine gun to be fired on base. So can you explain that in layman's terms? <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Shay. <laughs> uh, every range on every every range in Petawawa. So because they're DD weapons and all the weapons within the museum belong to the Department of National Defense, they can only be fired on a Department of National Defense range, uh, with the exception of certain uh, licenses and uh, agreements had otherwise, but in Petawawa, that's the rule. Every range on base will have a license, and this license will specify what caliber, what uh, bullet can be fired on that range, uh, and they don't always make sense. Uh, the Thompson submachine was a perfect because uh, it fires a 45 ACP round or a 0.45 inch automatic hole pistol round. It was designed for um, a pistol 1911 and then progressed throughout uh, history as a very heavy round. Um, unfortunately, no range on base had, had it in the license that we could fire 45 ACP or that caliber of bullet. And for that reason, we weren't allowed to shoot it in, uh, uh, back in the summer of 2019. I hope that's a little more clear. Yeah. Well, um, it is uh, very clear. And uh, again, it comes to, to the point, restoration is uh, a very specific type of uh, job in a museum setting. And uh, it deals with uh, a lot of details one doesn't think of when the job begins. And it takes experience uh, to, to achieve success, right? Uh, the trial and error is acceptable, but um, uh, you don't really want to mess up with um, art artifacts that are historically significant. So uh, much care must be taken when one approaches uh, a restoration project. Um, so now we are moving on to question number four. Yes. And uh, the question is, how did you get into this field? 
Did you always uh, knew you'd end up in a position such as this one? And do you want to stay in this position where uh, you see it as a stepping stone to the next job? So uh, Mathieu, uh, he's, uh, he's a military uh, personnel, so uh, he has a different story. <laughs> So for, for me, the question is somewhat twofold. Um, it's why did I join the military as well as why did I get involved with the museum? So I, I ended up joining the military uh, because my parents, they both had office jobs. They'd come home every day and they'd complain about it, about how they sat in the cubicle all day. And I wanted to do something different, something that involved working with my hands. Uh, I always question for as a form of mechanical art, the way that every single one will work uh, differently. You're dealing with different systems of operations and uh, everything functions differently from one part to the other. So I thought what better than being a weapons technician. The way I got into working with the museum was Shayana was actually, uh, or had contacted <laughs> my command uh, captain, or probably who I see, and he came down to the weapon shop and said, the museum wants you guys to go look at some of their guns. But our museum has guns. That's cool. Let's go take a look. And uh, what started out as a small restoration project ended up blowing up into something much bigger. And since that moment, I've been involved with the uh, CFP Petawala Military Museum. And I intend to continue remaining involved once I uh, return to Canada. Maybe we invite you to the RCR museum as well. I'd love, I'd love to come down for a visit. Absolutely. I think Shay and I had that planned uh, this year right. before I left for when I was supposed to leave for Wainwright, but that got canceled. And then before I went on deployment, however, uh, COVID being what it is, everything kind of got put to a stop. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the unfortunate situation. So, uh, Jeremy, uh, how did you... Up being a museum curator. Okay, well, um, like I said, uh, you know, when I went to school and I got my uh, BA in history, um, I was planning on, um, you know, becoming a teacher. Um, I, I love, I'm, I'm really enthused about education and uh, sharing knowledge, and I'm also, you know, one of the world's biggest history geeks uh, that's probably ever out there, um, and. Uh, so, you know, when the opportunity to, you know, to jump in as a career role, uh, move uh, into a museum, um, you know, I was uh, full in. So um, that's kind of how I, I got into it. And, you know, uh, and then next thing you know, I'm the executive director a couple of years later. Um, I don't see this as a stepping stone because, you know, as Shay said earlier, this is probably... You know, I enjoy my, I never have a Monday. Uh, I enjoy my job uh, all the time. And uh, I, I don't, I find there's not a stepping stone, but just greater challenges. So, you know, improving our museum, improving our museum community. Um, maybe in my senior years, I might uh, consult or, or work with other museums um, on their military vehicle restorations or programs. But uh, as long as uh, as long as the board of directors will have me, I'll probably be in this office. Yes, <laughs> it's true. Shay, um, I have more of a romantic story, I guess. I've always been going. My dad used to take me to museums all the time because it was a good way to get out of the house. It was cheap and a good way to get away from my mom. So I've been going to museums basically since I was little. And then I had um, a moment um, when I was in grade six where we found some railroad remnants and a dog's tooth on our school grounds. And so I said, let's go to the local museum. This is in St. John's in Newfoundland. And the curator there brought us back to the collections room and it was like being thunderstruck. It was full of these awesome things. And it wasn't like here where we have nice drawers and stuff. It was back in the early 80s. So wooden shelves with things in jars, animals, like just a ton of stuff. And that's where I fell in love. So I've always wanted to work in museums. 
Um, I'm in my dream job right now. I don't want to move. I like being here. It's given me the opportunity to meet people like um, Corporal Bergeron and get to work with him. I've also worked with the Dragoons who also worked with Jeremy with their stag hound and we were supposed to see that again, COVID. So I love what I'm doing. I want to stay here. I don't want to move around. I have, like Jeremy said, it's a constant learning opportunity. I have so many different objects and I'm constantly learning. So that's my story. Uh, okay, so I don't want to run late here. Uh, I have uh, question number five. Is it possible to work in museum restoration after a degree in archeology? span What do you think? Uh, I can't comment. I'm, I'm not too sure uh, what degrees are required, so I'm gonna pass it off to Jeremy. And I'm gonna very quickly pass it off to Shay. I, I, I know yeah. a lot of great uh, museums out there that deal with archeological artifacts, but um, ours is not one of them, Shay. Uh, yeah, and uh, Shay, I will let you answer, then I have uh, something to contribute here too. Yeah, I'm sure Georgiana actually has a better answer than I do. Um, you can work in restoration if you have an archaeological degree. Um, th there's a lot of things that you can do in heritage sector, depending on your degree. There's a lot of transferable skills. But Georgiana, you go ahead. Uh, so, uh, yes, if you take a degree in archaeology, you can be, uh, you can restore uh, archaeology pieces. Definitely, because uh, uh, as I mean, uh, here we have a panel, a panel of uh, people who work with uh, technology. Uh, our museums um, have a lot of technology in their collection and uh, it is important for uh, our museums, but that doesn't mean um, uh, other museums wouldn't uh, seek uh, experts in uh, archaeological restoration or artifact or photography. Uh, when I say artifact, I mean art, uh, sculpture, painting, books. Uh, there is a very wide um, uh, variety of um, specialities. For example, textiles, that is a very, very picky um, type of um, uh, technique to, uh, for someone to come uh, to have the expertise to do a textile restoration or painting. Uh, think of, um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, European museums or uh, European heritage sites, uh, monuments uh, that uh, you might have heard of in the news, uh, how they restored, for example, uh, I don't know, The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci and this kind of things. Uh, it, it's just uh, a different type of skills that can be acquired pursuing that type of uh, speciality. Like uh, you do an art uh, um, undergrad, visual arts undergrad, and then you move on to taking the classes that are applicable. There is a lot of chemistry amongst others. As there is engineering, as you can see, a uh, weapon stack for us. Uh, so um, uh, even, even a, uh, a um, chemical engineer can go into restoration because they will deal with the chemistry that is behind uh, many of the objects. Uh, and uh, this actually brings me to the next question. What would you need to, to do to become an art conservator as well as general museum conservator? And is it possible to be both? So uh, can I answer first and then I will uh, pass it on to you guys? All right, so uh, in order to become an art conservator, as I said, you take a, uh, an undergrad in visual arts of some sort, so you are uh, uh, familiar with uh, techniques of painting, drawing, sculpture, etc. And uh, uh, with that, you can start specializing in uh, painting um, restoration. Uh, paper restoration, ceramics, textile, etc. Um, 
I am not really aware of such degrees available uh, in Canadian universities, but I'm sure there must be a program and definitely there will be uh, such programs uh, in, um, uh, in the States, I believe. Uh, then um, to, the, to become a general museum conservator and is it possible to do both? Yes, it is possible to do both. I have never been a conservator myself, but I am familiar with the conservation techniques, yet I am uh, doing uh, very basic uh, um, maintenance, I call it maintenance, with our collection. It's uh, uh, sometimes it's as simple as housekeeping, just dust the object. And you have to know what type of uh, materials to use when you touch an object, right? Uh, the main point is, uh, again, you are not supposed to alter the object. You are supposed to restore it to its initial look. So uh, from there, uh, we know we can't uh, use, I don't know, chemical products uh, that are commercially available because they can destroy the object. Like you wouldn't uh, wipe uh, a metal or a weapon, you wouldn't wipe a weapon with uh, um, metal cleaners uh, you find in the grocery store. You have different other uh, type of um, uh, products that you are using. And uh, uh, when one chooses uh, to work in a museum, may it be a small museum or a big museum, doesn't matter. You'll see, uh, as Shay mentioned earlier, there are many transferable skills and uh, uh, one does have to um, uh, adjust to adapt to the reality of the job, the profile of the collection that they manage. So uh, yes, you can transfer from one to another. And uh, I don't want to uh, talk more because I have many, uh, I have many questions that came uh, through now. So here we have a, uh, the following question. Is a degree in restoration required or is it a skill you can learn through working with a restoration team? I think it's a little bit of both. I will uh, let you answer. And I also have um, a link I can uh, uh, provide. So uh, is a degree in restoration required or is it a skill you can learn through working with a restoration team? What do you think? So I, I'd say it's 100% a skill you can learn and not necessarily a skill you can learn, but a skill you can develop as well or have developed throughout your life. Um, me, for example, I don't have any formal education. I, I've gone to, I graduated high school and then I joined the military and I did the uh, required training courses for my trade. Uh, but uh, in terms of restoration or conservation, I've never been a part of that until I was involved with the Garrison Petawal Military Museum. And it, it was a learning curve for me as well. However, um, it, it's all things that can be developed. And I'm not sure that any when it comes to civilian museums or, or whatnot, but I know me, myself, I don't have a, a degree in restoration now. Jeremy. Um. I have to agree with Matt when it comes to the military vehicle side of it. I know that we have some people uh, with some specialty degrees that look after our, our military artifacts, non-vehicle. Uh, but when it comes to the vehicle restoration, it's all people bringing their own experience and their own uh, um, specialty to the restoration project and learning from other people in the field, uh, sort of a hand-to-hand -hand knowledge. Um, when it comes to vehicle or monument restoration, it's really uh, even you know people who come here with a, a very specific skill set, they're learning from the other members of the team every restoration we do. Um, so it's definitely something that that we would say on the vehicle side, uh, you can learn just by working with people who do it. Shay, I have to. 
Yeah, I have to agree with both of you. It's something you can either learn, go to school, or you can learn on the job. Everything is about research and creating a team with the expertise. And you can learn from that team as well. So both, you can you can do it both ways. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would just like to add, uh, Sarah sent me here a, co a, a link uh, in respect to uh, art uh, conservation and the restoration. There is a, uh, a department at uh, Queen's University. I think they, uh, uh, they have degrees in art conservation, art history and art conservation, but th this is just for art. So uh, as uh, all our three panelists have said, you may uh, end up very well in a, uh, uh, in a museum that is uh, dealing with technology. And if you are an engineer, you may fit very well, be very useful for a restoration project. And uh, that is the case, I mean, I know, um, uh, uh, for example, aviation museums. Uh, it's a type of uh, skill that is very specific. For example, so the, uh, there is a restoration project on a specific vehicle or, or, or aircraft or tank or um, uh, weapon. Only those people who have used it and work on it would be able uh, to answer some of the questions. For others, it would take a year or two before they, they learn uh, to do the research and find the answer to questions that they may have. Uh, another question is what fields of study are required? Uh, shall we take uh, short ter turns here? Uh, Corporal Bergeron already uh, explained, but uh, I will let him uh, talk further. So uh, as for fields of studies, I, I couldn't give you a, a definite answer on that. Um, I know it, to me, it has more to do with uh, the passion and the willingness to uh, learn about these specific own and do the study and do the research and develop the skills in order to do it properly. Me, myself, it's uh, with firearms. Um, I wouldn't know the first thing when it comes to trying to restore a tank or a vehicle. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, as long as you have uh, the skills and the passion to learn about it on your own, I'm not too sure past that. Hmm. Jeremy? Uh, well, museums are multidisciplinary uh, workplaces. And what I can tell you is that the people I work with um, come from all different backgrounds. Uh, some of them are currently serving, former serving, civilian. You mentioned engineers, welders, students, teachers. Um, so my best advice would be, if you want to be in the museums industry, then get there now. Go and volunteer, meet some of the people who work in the industry um, get that foot in the door and see some of the skill sets uh, that are utilized the most uh, in the industry. Yes, that is correct. Shay? Um, yeah, you can get, I got a degree at Fleming College. I put a link, but I think I directed it to Marcus instead, but uh, it's to the Fleming program. And the Fleming program, you, you need a background in something in order to get in that. It's a post-diploma program. So you can have history. I've worked with people who had degrees in biology and different types, science, physics. Um, and then they go into a museum course and you can go on, on that way. So there's a whole variety of, if you want to pursue secondary education, there's a whole variety uh, of programs that you can take um, where you can work in museums. I just want to get back really quickly to, um, someone had the question about um, uh, art and restoration. There is a great uh, YouTube series of videos produced by MoMA, the, um, the Museum mm -hmm. of Modern Art in New York. And you can actually see what it takes uh, to restore one of their paintings. And it's, it really gives you a really good idea of the techniques, the teamwork that's involved, and um, the tedious work as well that's involved in getting one of those paintings nice and cleaned. I highly recommend it if you have time. Yes. Uh, so I think we only have uh, uh, eight more minutes and we still have two more questions to go through. I'm going to push through the questions. 
was there a specific skill that you had to learn for a project you did and you did not expect you had to learn that pro that uh, skill so were you taken by surprise <laughs> in other words uh yes for sure so uh going back to the mp40 uh we had to uh weld when it came to it we had to weld a certain part on because it kept breaking off did i expect i had to learn how to weld in the middle of july in 2019 no but uh it came and i had to learn and uh, we fired. uh yeah probably welding using blades all these skills that i intended on learning eventually just not the time <laughs> yeah so jeremy yeah uh, i know we have to go quick uh really for me it was um a challenge we had we were tasked uh, by for the by the unit to restore their gate guards um around the city and so we're, we're used to restoring vehicles that are kept inside they're kept operational as as your car or any current military vehicle and we had to relearn um how to look after an object that was exterior and to preserve it so you know, we spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time with experts learning about different types of paint, uh, rust inhibitors, rust sealing, um, you know, all these different, you know, polys and stuff like that. So I had really had to learn a lot on that. And then because of that, I had the privilege of, of assisting other organizations and museums uh, with that knowledge. Okay. Uh, so really briefly, because I wasn't actually doing the restoration, I was sort of the team lead and getting everybody together. The biggest skill that I had to learn was how to talk military speak and get that jargon and be able to understand what it ranges and all that other information. And luckily I had excellent teachers. Corporal Bergeron helped me a lot in explaining how all the weapons work. So I'm not an expert in that, but at least I have, it's, it's definitely something I gained. Yes, uh, I agree. Uh, I, I would say that um maybe I'm not a restorer I'm a museum curator but every museum I worked in I had to learn new skills the uh, on the job learning so uh, circling back to something that Jeremy mentioned earlier go uh, go now and find out exactly where you want to go yeah that's that's actually the way to to proceed if you uh, wish to to go on a heritage um, a museum um, path, it is good to volunteer in museums and see what's happening and then you will be able to, you'll be more informed when you have to choose. And on that note, I am going to uh, add uh, one more thing and then we move on to the next, uh, last question. So the thing that I wanted to add, we spoke about restoration and we spoke about uh, restoring artifacts, but there is also uh, heritage restoration, monuments, uh, buildings, and monuments, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't even go into the uh, variety of skills required to restore a building. And it takes uh, from engineers to masonry, carpentry, uh, high-tech uh, design, it takes all sorts of uh, uh, expertise and categories of uh, skills. And now uh, with four more minutes to go, we have the last question and that is a very particular question. I think uh, probably Corporal Bergeron will be able to answer it. Have you worked on any restoration projects with larger caliber weapons like artillery or tanks? And what are the laws similar as for small arms, I've heard there is no cannon license. I think this question means if there is any legislation in regards to how uh, we go about uh, uh, restoring uh, weaponry and military vehicles. So for us with the Garrison Petawawa Military Museum, uh, licensing isn't necessarily a concern. Belong to the base itself. They are uh, Canadian Armed Forces D and D establishment, meaning um, as per Section One Seventeen, I believe, of the Criminal Code. I'm not sure on the subsection. Uh, 
D&D and CAF employees are exempt from the Firearms Act itself. That's what allows us to do training carrying around uh, what on civilian side would be a prohibited weapon. That being said, up until last May, um, you were allowed to own with a non-restricted firearms license, um, anti-tank guns, civilian side. Um, I'm not too sure on the, if there was a size restriction, I know some of them are considered controlled goods and you'd have to get additional licenses for that. But I do know people who have owned, uh, uh, uh 75 millimeter cannons. Um, now that changed, uh, with the order in council last May when, uh, a, uh, a, a caliber restriction was put in. So anything with a bore diameter of over 20 millimeters or uh, has a muzzle energy of more than 10,000 joules is now prohibited firearm. Uh, unfortunately, prohibited firearms licenses are extremely hard to get in Canada. Uh, I know you can only get it through um, uh, being grandfathered. That being said, I'm not a lawyer in expert firearms laws. I just know what I do uh, with the museum. Uh, that being said, I haven't started working on it yet, but the museum does have a German anti-tank gun that sits in the uh, uh, in the lobby that I've been dying to get my hands on. Uh, I believe that is a 45 millimeter if memory serves, and that will be the largest restoration project that I've worked on to date. Jeremy? Uh I can't really add to what Matt said. We fall under the same regulations. We're yeah. exempt. Um, we can have small arms and tank cannons. Uh, and I think I think Matt laid that out uh, as best. So I can't add more. <laughs> well, uh, I think time is up. And I want to thank our panelists for, first of all, uh, taking the time to produce the video. Um, and uh, for being here today to share their knowledge and experience. And uh, well, ultimately for agreeing to participate in this event, I hope uh, the, your questions um, were answered. And um, feel free to contact our public programmer should you have any further questions. I think you have the, the contact info and uh, uh, we will uh, we will take it from there now. Uh, the time is up. And uh, again, thank you to our. Uh